Welcome back to How to Tickle Yourself. I'm your host, Duff McDonald, along with my co-host, Matt McButter. I am thrilled to introduce today's guest, who I've known for a little over a decade. His name is Elliot Landy. While that name may not be familiar to some of you, I can guarantee you that you are quite familiar with Elliot's work. Best known for his classic rock photographs, Elliot was one of the first music photographers to be recognized as an artist. His celebrated works include portraits of Bob Dylan on the cover of Nashville Skyline, the band on the covers of both music from Big Pink and the band, Janis Joplin, Van Morrison. He took the picture on the cover of Moondance, Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, and others. Elliot's iconic photos of the band and Dylan during the years they resided and recorded in Woodstock, New York, and his coverage of the 69 Woodstock Festival, for which he was an official photographer, captured the attention of a new generation seeking spiritual and artistic freedom. His imagery has become synonymous with the town, and I can tell you that is an absolute fact because you can almost you can't really go into any building in this town without seeing it. One of Elliot's photos. He <laughs> lives just down the street from uh, here at Tickle Headquarters. I've been to his studio several times, where he has graciously let me pour over unpublished photos of Bob Dylan. What else could a man want in life? Since 1967, Elliot's work's been exhibited in galleries and museums worldwide, published on the covers of major magazines in the U.S. and internationally, including the New York Times, Rolling Stone, and the Saturday Evening Post. He is the author of 11 books, which puts him at twice yours truly, and is including his latest photographs of Janis Joplin on the road and on stage and the band photographs, 1968-69. So Elliot used Kickstarter uh, several years ago to raise money to produce his first book of band photos. And that campaign, which only targeted, uh, I think it was 30,000 at first. Gosh, I don't remember. uh, Was ridiculously successful, raising $195,000 in the end. He's back at it. Elliot has launched another Kickstarter a few weeks ago. He's here to tell us about it, and we're here to convince you to contribute to it and get yourself an early copy of that uh, second book of band photos. We have the first one here in this house, and it's amazing. Welcome to the show, Elliot. It's been a while. It's great to see you again. Well, I don't think there's anything else to say about me. Right? We're done. Thanks and goodbye. (laughs) Thanks for listening. Except what do I want for lunch, you know? (laughs) Present moment, traveling town to town, the mystery of the motion, right here, right now, right here, right now, whoa, right here, right now. So uh, we are uh, we are you're doing a second book of band photos. Uh, you launched the Kickstarter and um, tell us about it. It's uh, from what I can see online. It looks like another beautiful book. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's going to be actually, actually first of all, the, the reason I'm doing a second book is that for the first book, we went over all the pictures I had taken the band, at least this woman, Rachel Dobkin, who's now an independent musician, um, went over all the pictures I had taken and she picked out, let's say 600 photographs that she thought should be in the book. And I had, uh, I, I, in addition to my, my core set, let's say, which is the ones that I show online. And, um, uh, I went over those 600 and I picked 300 that I liked enough, um, to consider for the book. And I made eight by 10 proof prints. My process of making books is physically, I don't do it on the, I don't decide things on the computer. So I actually had physical prints of 300 
uh, photographs. And then we narrowed those down to about 200 um, and uh, then made the book. And then so I had them in boxes like uh, set A, set B, rejects, seconds, possibles, all the different uh, um, sorting of which pictures should be in the book. Maybe a year after the book had been published, I passed this shelf with all these boxes of prints. I should have one here, but actually not on video. It doesn't matter. All these eight by 10 boxes of prints, uh, proof prints, I call them, but they're really good prints. Um, and I opened one up just to see what was in there. And I'm looking at the one that says seconds and then the one that says thirds. And I'm thinking, what? We didn't use that picture. We didn't use that picture. I can't believe that these pictures weren't in the book because they're some of my favorite pictures there. And they weren't in the book simply because it was limited to 160 pages and 12 by 12 inches in size. So at that point, when I saw how many of really uh, amongst my favorite photographs were not were, had to be left out of the first book, I said, I have to do a second one. So that's how the second book was born out of necessity, <laughs> because I hate to roll over wherever I'll be after I pass uh, saying, oh, man, those pictures never got published in a book. So here we have book two. <laughs> so I saw something that said uh, Elliot. So, Matt, Elliot's has more than 10,000 photos of the band. I guess that's true. Wow. We, <laughs> just of the band. And wrote, yeah, yeah, just of the band, yeah. Incredible. Well, you know, it was very beautiful to be with them. Really, there was the, it was the first, um, I can't, can't say job I did, because it wasn't a job. It was like it was like free form, you know, come on over and take some pictures like that. But it was the first body of work I did of a, of a maybe the only one. I don't think I ever photographed another rock and roll group like that, uh, that extensively, because I moved on to another genre of photography after 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 my two years doing music photography. Um, and uh, I had complete freedom. And I was really was and am still into the beauty of the image. To me, that's the most important thing. Is it harmonious? Is it are the people in the right places? And of course, and do they look good also? But for me, it has to be a good photograph first. And secondarily, secondarily it's who's in the picture. <laughs> so um, I was just totally into photography, into the art. And I, I hate to use the word art because I don't do it as art. I do it as beauty. I do it as a way of sharing a, a perfect moment or create or getting, capturing a perfect composition uh, uh, of, of something. So it was uh, something I did was really in love with what I was doing. You know, it was my early days of photographing, and these were really nice people to photograph. They looked really good, and they were great human beings also. So that's how I got 10,000 negatives. It was just very easy. Um, they asked me after, um, after the big pink thing was done, uh, they kept saying, come on over and take some pictures. We're going to have another album at some point, you know, and just come on over. So I kept being invited over or else I was free. I got friendly with them and they said, Would you, I was, I, I began photographing them while I was living in New York City. And they said, anytime you're up here, come on and stay over. This is Rick and Rick and Levon. Uh, we're sharing a house at that point after Big Pink. And I said, come over, man. You could crash on the couch anytime, you know, just don't even have to tell us you're coming to show up. So it was that kind of relationship, really. And now looking back, I'm saying maybe I should have come more, you know, because I never went up there specifically or especially to take photographs of them. And it's OK, let's go take pictures of these. At that time, they weren't they weren't very famous. So it wasn't a question of that. But so I, I just, got I, I got a question for you about the, the subjects, because like going beyond the bands. So, again, Bob Dylan, Janis Joplin, Van Morrison, Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix. Um, I, I'm not a photographer, and so I don't know what your photographer's eye looks for. But do people that are in the throes of like a creative explosion, like all of these people were at some point or another, or still, does is there? Can we talk about an aura? Can you see an aura that like if you turn the camera towards me, for example, you wouldn't see the same thing that you see glowing off of someone like Van Morrison? You know, I don't have that kind of clairvoyant vision. Some people do, but I don't have that. I, I do very many. We could use the word psychic things and very many spiritual energy things. But seeing auras 
uh, and reading people's past lives and stuff like that is not something I have the skill to do. There are people I know that <laughs> communicate neither. with spirit and so on. Well, some people do. I know a lot of people, not a lot, but some people that do that, you know, and I'm very much involved in that area now that you bring it up. But um, I uh, no, so I don't I, I never saw it. What, what I just see is is phys- actually though you're 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 asking a deeper question is does does their spiritual energy the high level of spiritual connection that they have by spiritual connection I mean connection to the allness of life uh, they're really tapped into themselves and what they do so much differently and better than anybody else in the world does at that moment they're doing it there's so much a part of the energy the allness of life. That that energy comes through in my photographs, and I guess, right. That's what, that's what I meant. That's yeah. what I meant. How but, do you? I don't. I don't see it physically. I just okay. wait for that perfect moment, or I just keep shooting until it happens, and then I edit afterwards. I tell people I'm not a great photographer. I'm a great editor because I I pick <laughs> out afterwards. I'm very. I spend a lot of time choosing the right photograph. Um, actually, this morning I had an idea of what I'm going to do in the band in the band uh, book is that. The the picture that's on the cover of the second of the second album, the the, the called the title the band, is a photograph of the five guys, and we took that in the rain, and um, for uh, and I took a lot of photographs of that that scene. They were they were uncomfortable standing in front of the camera. They were walking around. They were this. Uh, it was very difficult to get them. They were not smiling. They were too. I don't know. It was very very hard to do. It took a long time. Not hard, but it took a long mm-hmm. time. So. Uh, when I created my website, I put the wrong shot as as that cover. In other words, I picked out the bit what I like best for my website, and the photograph of that sequence, I picked the wrong one. It was one with Garth, and this is not video anyway, but it was one with Garth. I'll show it to this here. He was he his his jacket was was this way, was showing his shirt a little bit, and the one we chose for the cover, the one I chose for the cover actually, was with his jacket closed more okay and i didn't recognize i didn't realize that the the picture i said the band album cover shot was not the right one interesting okay? i'm and looking somebody, at it right now it's the black and white with with the five like uh, are you the looking band? at the yeah. one that wasn't the shot or that was the shot i'm looking at the cover of the album oh, the cover okay yeah so now, it's it's Gar's, yeah jacket is if open you go on my website the one the first one that's listed there. Anyway, we'd have to kind of demonstrate. But anyway, what what I want to say about this is that somebody wrote to me and said, that's not the same picture that's on the cover. And I looked at it and I saw that it wasn't the same picture. And at first I thought, well, it's so close. It doesn't really matter. But then I compared the two. And even though it's very, very minuscule difference, it really makes a difference in how you feel it. And Mm. I decided to... In this book, just this morning, I was thinking, I, I, I thought of this. I decided in this book to write about that and to talk about it and to show both pictures and to kind of and to kind of share with people how I how how a photograph can be experienced, which is to feel it, not just to look at it and see what's in it. OK, that's Bruce Springsteen or that's God, or the band, whatever, but to just kind of be sensitive to what you're feeling from looking at the photograph because that's how I evaluate pictures. And I've always done that. And, and whenever I've been, been guiding anyone or a few times I've taught, I always say that you have to feel the photograph You look at it and pay attention to what you're feeling, not what you're thinking about. So, unless of mm. course you're doing an advertisement or somebody has a thing mm-hmm. where you, you got to show the whole Coca-Cola bottle or whatever it is. But I'm talking about the art, meaning the experience of real photography. I'll say photography done for its own sake not for another reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, your, um, your work, uh, you know, your, your photography has been used so extensively on, on album covers that I inadvertently, I mean, without being familiar with, with you as a photographer, I have collected dozens of your work. I mean, I have had dozens of pieces of your work in my personal collection, either as albums or, or CD covers. I mean, I'm just looking through the catalog now. It's, it's quite, uh, quite uncanny. I mean, just how, how many iconic covers oh. you have done. So how is it that you, I mean, did you, did you kind of from, was it from the work with, with the band that all of us, that, that kind of led to you getting tapped as actually not, actually not. I, I, didn't get asked to do very many album covers in my lifetime, actually. 
Uh, I only was involved in the music and music photography for less than two years, in fact. And, and, and like and, 50, and, 50 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It was a long time ago. <laughs> Not that I can, I mean, I've, I've photographed music <laughs> since then, uh, like 10, 15, 20 years after that, just for fun and so on. But uh, people never asked me, even in those years, I didn't get many calls for work from all that work or not. I, I feel like it wasn't my my destiny to to be stuck in that. And I don't mean stuck in a bad way. But when you're successful, making a huge amount of money, let's say, it would be hard to leave that. But in fact, that didn't happen for me. Um, so after I did music from Big Pink, that, that's when Bob asked me to photograph him for the cover this evening post or Al, a writer called Al Arano, it's a good friend of Bob's, uh, did the asking, but Bob said to him, because I had met Bob at a party at, at um, a picnic at uh, Albert's house, it wasn't really a picnic, but it was outdoor eating stuff. And I met him just for a moment while I was photographing the band. You know, we just didn't even say anything to each other. I mean, we said hi, but we had no conversation. But when uh, Bob agreed to do a picture uh, for the cover of the Saturday Evening Post, he asked Al Arano, was the writer, to contact me for it. And then after that, and, and we got very friendly when I was doing that. Um, and we had a really, uh, I was closer to him than any other musician I had photographed in terms of our communication and conversation. Um, and um, after that, he, uh, I guess it was six or eight months later, he called me up one day and said, um, I just got back from Nashville. I, I, uh, I need a picture for the back of the album. So for the back of my new album, which is Nashville Skyline, he was planning to put the the cover of the skyline, the picture of what was on the back of the album, which was a photograph of the skyline of Nashville on the front. <laughs> Make that his cover, ah. Nashville Skyline, you know. Ah. But, and my picture was supposed to be on the back, but the picture was so good that he decided that you know he wanted it on the front. Um, so he said to you know come on over, and he played me the acetate for it and stuff, and and um, we did that. And but and then um, then I got contacted by Warner, art director from Warner Brothers, to photograph Van Morrison. And then, who's still, who's still all, going strong too, right? It, it, He's got yeah, an album casual. coming out. It was all okay. It wasn't like an assignment, you know. Go over and see him, you know, like that. <laughs> like, very easy going, and there was no pre agreement. It was the days when you just did things. Um, but <laughs> and, and and then I did a few. I got a guy named Bob, a producer, a music producer, great man named Bob Thiel, who produced, uh, I believe, John Coltrane's. Yeah, he produced John Coltrane and and a lot of jazz greats. And he asked me to photograph Albert Eiler and John Lee Hooker. And um, I think that was it. So very, very few. I, I did another one. I can barely remember what it is, but almost no sign. Nobody really grabbed on. I didn't have an agent at that point. And if I uh, think if you want to be in business, you should have an agent. You know? <laughs> and, and I was always like that. I just took what came along. Like my, my, interaction my connection to music photography was really by chance it mm -hmm. wasn't that i loved music and taking pictures of it it was that i was i was um i, I don't know do you want to hear this, this yeah yeah oh, yeah, yeah. yeah this is gold <laughs> I was, <laughs> um i was um taking photographs of anti-war movement i was trying to help stop the vietnam war and um, I went, I had approached major publications with pictures I had taken at demonstrations, and they weren't interested in it. And I began photographing with underground newspapers, uh, one called the New York Free Press, later named the West, no, sorry, the West Side News, later renamed the New York Free Press. And then there was a, a paper called The Rat, which was uh, another, uh, a new publication, but all against the war and all, all for women's rights and pro-abortion and all the good things in life that we're still struggling for. Um, so I was taking pictures of anti-war demonstrations and, and uh, positive things like that. And one evening when, and I became the photo editor of this underground paper called The Rat. The Rat meaning subterranean news, rats, mm. underground news, subterranean yeah. news, okay. Um, so I didn't like the name, but anyway, it, it certainly fit. You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> me, I'm positive all the way. You don't if you don't like rats. If you love rats, then call call your newspaper the rat. But anyway, um, so one evening after we had put the paper to bed, it, the office was on like Seventh Street, just off Second Avenue. I was walking down Second Avenue with a couple of other people from the paper, and I saw this marquee saying "Country Joe, Country Joe and the Fish Light Show," and I said. I, I didn't say anything. I said, what's that? You know, to my friends there. And I walked over to the box office and I, uh, and I was asking what, what was going on. And I heard this incredible music coming from inside, really loud and fantastic music. And uh, I had a press pass with me and I showed her the press pass and it was the woman at the, in the ticket office. And she said, go ahead in and so on. So I go in and I'm, I'm, I met with this wall of light. It was a Joshua light show. And light shows are very special. They were very different than, um, so I'm just thinking, you know, this is my first interview for this, for the band book. And I'm probably never going to want to say this again. I'm not, <laughs> I could say this every six months, I think, you know, the story, because it's also a lot of it's in my book, Woodstock Vision. Woodstock Vision, the spirit of regeneration available almost for nothing secondhand. You can buy it from me, signed. But it's a great book. I mean, it really it talks about all this. It's right around the corner here. Right. It's in my Bob Dylan okay. shrine okay. where there's a okay. couple okay. Elliot Landy books. Okay. But anyway, so I'm just thinking how I'm I'm so happy to talk about it now. And I probably wouldn't be happy again for a few months. So <laughs> so it's nice to do this. Thank you. Um so um I, I wanted to get up close to see the musicians. So I took out my camera because that would allow me to go up to the front of the stage. And I did that. And that was my be the beginning of my music photography career, so to speak. Um, and I don't know if I described the light show, but the light shows were were very different than any kind of experience you have now because there were five people, four or five people really jamming with the music. And they were jamming independent. It was like total. It was like jazz. It was a jazz, a visual jazz experience. Of course, they weren't synchronizing with each other. One person had a, a 16 millimeter projector they were running, and another person had slides and two projectors, and and another person had or two other people probably had oil, colored oil and water. And oil and water don't mix. But when you bang up, when you bang a plate of of oil, uh, you, you, they took a dish and they had uh, oils, colored oils and and water. And colored water in the same bowl, and and they 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 moved rhythmically up and down with this plate or whatever they were doing, a disc, to keep in time to the music, and they projected that on a, a screen that was the whole size of the stage. It wasn't just a little screen that you watched on; it wasn't a video. It took up the whole. And it was quite an amazing because you were seeing really two musical experiences: one, the visual music experience of a light show, and the second one was this audio part of it. So anyway. So um, I went to that, and also I, I needed to make money. I wasn't getting any money from from these from the newspaper <laughs> photographs, anti-war pictures, whatever I was taking. Um, so I I sold one picture to one magazine, and um, then two weeks later, the next act, the next band at the this was the the theater was the Anderson Theater, and two weeks later, the next band was Big Brother and the Holding Company with Janis Joplin, and wow. so. Yeah, so I was sure to be there. I didn't had no idea who they were or what they were, no clue at all. You know, so you can imagine what a thrill it is to go in and experience something like that. And Country Joe's mm -hmm. performance was fabulous, also. But to go in and and I was because I had a camera, I was right up uh, right up close to the stage. There were different days then. You know, there was no rushing the stage and no problems like that. Everybody trusted everyone to act act uh, humanely. I'll call it. To act 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 decently so um that was you know my first two concerts and uh then i went to to try and sell the photographs uh, to make some money from them and that led me to um, columbia records and the art director of columbia records bob cato said said to me i have no oh because janice had been signed to columbia right he said, I have no use for this now, but I'm going to give you $300 anyway, just for taking them, man, you know, you know, and, and maybe I'll use them, you know, and in the future, if we need them, we'll buy them from something like that. It was, I just wanted as a gift, you know, so, so he did that. And um, then I went to, right, I showed the pictures, right, Al, Janice, wow, 
I don't know. Somehow I got friendly with them. Of course, you could go backstage then. So because I had the camera, they just let me upstairs. And I went into the dressing room. And when I and I was taking pictures, Ed Sanders from the Fugs was there. I remember during one thing, Bob Fast, this great radio radio star, I would call him. Star meaning shining brightly. And I don't mean standing out, but shining brightly and shedding wisdom and light, cosmic light on life. He was uh, with WBAI for many years and had great, used to cover all the demonstrations and all the new news and everything positive and progressive. Uh, he, he had interviewed people and so on. Anyway, he was there. Um, and then one one time, uh, Linda Eastman was there, who later married Paul McCartney. You know, she was a photographer. She was practicing photography at that point and so on. I remember one one night she... Uh, after a show, I think it was at the Anderson, so it m must have been the first, the first show I saw. I'm not sure, but I remember her coming over. To, it was raining out, so we were both on the street, Second Avenue. I was trying to get a cab, and she borrowed like ten dollars from me. She said, "Can I borrow?" It was five or ten dollars. I'm not sure which one, <laughs> but she said, "Can I?" Uh, and uh, Paul, McCart so, Paul McCartney owes you ten dollars. No, yeah, no, did no, you get it back? No, no, no. she paid him back the next time <laughs> I saw her. Yeah, you know, no, nothing bad to say about that, you know. But I, you, you know, but I, I just remember that moment and so on. Uh, so, um, so let's talk about the band book again. You got a Kickstarter going um, with. I went on there yesterday. Uh, all the different levels. Um, uh, it's. All the photos that you wanted from the other one that weren't in the in the first one. Uh, what what uh, what's has there been some response already? How how are people reacting to it? It's actually doing very well. I think it's it's got like sixteen thousand dollars. The the minimum I need to do it is sixty five thousand dollars. What did I say? Seventy five. I'm not sure. I have to look this up. But. Um, we really need a lot more than that because people have to be paid for working and for picking out pictures and stuff. But the printing, uh, I just calculated what the printing was going to cost and, and what promotion was going to cost and so on. I said, well, the really the minimum amount that that I would I need to be able to devote the time to this um, would be whatever it was. I'll tell you in a minute here. Anyway, so we've already done sixteen thousand dollars worth and it's doing really well. Or how much is it? Um, yeah, sixty-five thousand, and it's already gotten. See, people can track this now. Uh, Sixteen thousand three hundred dollars on Sweet. it. So, so no complaints about that. But I need a lot more <laughs> because I'll, I'll tell you why I need a lot more. Because the way I do a book, the way I did the first band book is that we made all these proofs. Um, first of all, and you know, 600 print, uh, 300 prints. And then I go over the prints and I, I, I pick them out, you know, I look at them and I, and I, I call that down to the 200 or whatever it was. And then I, I look at them together. I put them next to each other and then I put them on the other side of each other and I see how they're going to look as partners on a page spread, let's say. And I again, I do that by feeling what I feel from from it. And there's a considerable difference whether a picture's on the right of another picture or on the left of another picture. Um, and then I uh, I have a designer who's working in house. At least I did then. And so she would then lay them out on a page, maybe two full two full picture and full size pictures on each page. And then we'd print that out full size, the book was going to be 12 by 12 inches, so it's a 24 inch spread. So then I print that out and I, and I put that on the wall and I look at it for a while and I think, does that really work? And of course, a lot of times I'll think, well, let's try something else because I'm a very, um, I, I change my mind easily and often. <laughs> um, so, That's a good trait. So we, we like that trait. I hope so. I hope so. It better, it better be or I've been in trouble for all my life. <laughs> So anyway, so I no, I really put a lot of effort and energy into creating the most beautiful book that I can make it. And then when I send it to the printer, I have them make uh, what's called wet print, wet proofs. Well, the general process for printing books today is that a printer, everything is laid out and they make a proof prints, but they print it on a digital printer like an Epson or, or an HP printer. Uh, and and then they send you those proofs, and from those proofs, you're supposed to the the author 
or the art director is supposed to correct the color and you're supposed to correct whatever needs to be corrected. But the color isn't isn't even close to exact. It was close to exact, but it's not right at all. So I paid for 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 the proofs to be done on the actual printing press. And that's rather expensive to mm. do it. But it gives me the, the ability to really make it as close to perfect, that, well, uh, to make it as good as possible for the, the printing press. I once saw an Italian book that was printed with 12 inks, like 12 <laughs> different inks. And I, I wish I still had it. But uh, with with this, so this is really the, uh, I don't know of a better process that I can use than what I'm using now. Um, um, and, and so I, and I, it costs I do a as good money. as we can. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and those color proofs. So then I correct the color proofs and I have them redo it again. And we go anyway. So, so that's why I need a lot of money for this aside. <laughs> OK, so where um, what about you? Uh, you occasionally have shows in New York and Woodstock. You got any um, gallery shows coming up? I don't have anything coming into? up. I kind of I kind of dropped everything when COVID hit. Actually, uh, I had something I was. um what was it? Oh, there's something I was supposed to appear at, and I didn't do that. There's a few things, a few appearances, but no. And I had a, I had a couple of shows in Woodstock. I don't know if you saw any at the Photography Center. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was really, it was a small show um, because they have a small space. That's why. But I had that, and um, oh, right in Germany. Oh, yes. Wow. Uh, I had some people in Germany promoting very beautiful large shows. Um, go on, I'll, I'll give you links for it. It's there was a show there, and uh, there's a church in Nuremberg, Germany, and they rented out their space for 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 exhibitions and performances and so on. And it's a beautiful. It's it's the inside of a church. So the the exhibition that I had there, uh, that they made large, like church size window blow ups of Joe oh, Cocker wow. and Janis Joplin. It's it's online, okay? If you go to my website, the link will be there. It's a Nuremberg show, and it's amazing. I was there. I went there for that, and so I also filmed it. I also made a videotape of it, and it was like 130 prints, really good prints, plus these large pictures and, and all kinds of, and, and the flowing lights and stuff. I was supposed to show some videos also, but that didn't really happen. It was too, it wasn't the right venue for that. But anyway, uh, yeah. So just in Europe, I, I had a, a similar show in Hamburg and a similar show in Berlin for the last few years, but really nothing in the United States in the last couple of years. Um, I'd All right, well, have you got to get back the out there on the road, yeah. Except for the Woodstock shows, yeah. So now I would appear publicly, but only with a mask on because COVID is still dangling. And I'm, we're, My wife and I are 80 years old. I don't feel 80 years old, but I look in the mirror and I say, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, don't, you don't look a day over 75, Elliot. Come on. <laughs> wow. That's the nicest thing that's been said to me in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> because okay, you so some, Because you said some great things at the beginning of the show. Too, so, I can't. So, so listeners, check out Elliot's Kickstarter campaign for his second book of band photos. Uh, it's active now for another 50 days or so. Uh, you want to check that out. Also check out his website. What's your URL again, Elliot? Elliotlandy.com. Two Elliot L's and two T's. Elliotlandy.com. Uh, as Matt says, uh, Elliot's work has, uh, is imprinted in most of our minds, even if we didn't know it. And, um, the, the, like you said, the, the feelings that come through in your photos are definitely part of my memories of the music itself. Right. So, right. um, yeah, real art. That's what, when I was taking those pictures, I was really part of the music. I just, my mind, if you ask me questions about what I was doing or seeing, I can't tell you because I'm just, I'm, my mind disappears and I just kind of become mm -hmm. part of what was happening. So I guess, I guess that shows it's kind of like a meditate. The point of meditation is that, so I don't didn't think of it as that, but now that we're talking about it, also this book is going to be the same size, twelve by twelve inches as the first one, and will fit perfectly as a pair, and also perfectly ah. next to the <laughs> band albums because it's the same size as an same LP. Same size album. as an LP, really yeah. cool. Which happened by chance. I, your I know, shelf is just about. waiting for that book, listeners. Your shelf is hungry oh. for this book to be well, on it. Also, also the first edition, which is what this is, is the edition that I supervised perfectly, exactly. I. Every, I supervise the printing, so it is really 
a great visual reproduction of these photographs. I can't speak for second and third editions. They're not supervised that carefully, which usually someone else is in charge and so on. So it's, it's worth getting a first edition copy of these things. And I have a few first edition copies for sale as part of the, of the first book also. That's part wow. of the uh, of the reward in this Kickstarter. So oh, I think cool. there's about 60 of them left, I think, total. Very All cool. right. Run, to, run, don't walk to your internet browser, people. Elliot, thank you. It's great well, to see you. you. Thank you, Matt. Really great meeting you. Pleasure. Great Bye. to see you again. Bye. Cheers. Thank you for this. I met Elliot uh, just over 10 years ago. A friend was talking to him about selling some photos and we went up and I was just amazed. I was like, oh my God, you are in my house in so many different ways already. And if not in your house, in your mind. Oh yeah. Like, like his Joe Cocker photo from Woodstock, that's probably the iconic Woodstock photo. Right? Well, also, and, I mean, the, the cover of the Woodstock album that everybody remembers, it's like a couple sort of, uh, you know, with a... Uh, sleeping bag kind of around them and everybody kind of off in the background. There's a kite in the background. Everybody, you know, everybody remembers that. Also, I mean, you know, the, the, the one we talked about, I think the most or at, at the beginning, the, um, the cover of Nashville skyline with Dylan's like holding the guitar and kind of tipping his hat. That's like one of the most iconic Dylan portraits yeah. to, in, in my mind. Yeah. Um, and he's got, he's got one of that, that's sort of tinted it. So it's got a red, uh, a, I don't know the terminology, but it's a beautiful, um, it's not in my collection yet, but he's just down the road. I'm working yeah. up to it. And Van Morrison Moondance. I mean, how many people had that in their collection, right? It's got the right. multiple shots of, yeah. of, of Van and kind of different pensive looks or whatever. It's so, so Elliot iconic. Does, he does energy work too, where um, he sits with people and does that stuff. That's why I asked that question. I just used the wrong term. So I said aura, but. Um, it's like, no, of course he's capable of seeing it because he captured it so many times, right? The mm -hmm. sort of the glow coming off people. Uh, so listeners, I have the first band book. It's beautiful, uh, worth checking out. Also this other one, um, a beautiful art project. And as you can tell from what he was saying there, the guy clearly cares about quality a lot more yeah. than oh yeah i mean the fact that he's like you know make sure you get the first edition because i will be supervising the printing and making sure that the colors are exact yeah. i can't guarantee that on the second and the third edition so you know get yourself to the kickstarter if you want the real thing i thought another another just um you know line line he mentioned which i wrote down was great he said you know we didn't he didn't have a contract i guess with the columbia i think it was the columbia guy and he said uh he said, you know, that was the day, th those were the days you just did things. Right. Right. Like you just did As them. Which, to yeah. I mean, I feel like we might be at a little bit of a resurgence here. Hopefully. Uh, you know, a little bit like with, you know, with COVID, I think a lot of people started just doing things again, right. Whether mm -hmm. it was, you know, starting a podcast or a t-shirt company or everybody's, you know, COVID, uh, COVID side hustles or hobbies that turned into amazing things thinking thinking too much is the death of us right We've, when we um as he said in his in his when he's talking about taking his pictures if you can disappear what he means mm -hmm. by disappearing is your mind disappears the thinking part of you and you're just there um yes. i'm 100 percent in support of that yeah don't overthink things but don't underthink them either that's my motto exactly <laughs> or as um as Herbie Cohen would tell you, you've got to care, but not that not, much. Just not too much. Yeah. All right. I got two things for you today. The first one I heard yesterday for the first time ever, I was talking to my friend JC Spender, um, one of my mentors. And he uh, he often says, he's like, of course, naturally, you've heard of so-and-so or such and such. And it's never the case. And but he's being kind. And he so he brought up a Latin term called tertius gaudens. Unfamiliar. I know some Latin terms, not that one. OK, so it falls into the category of like schadenfreude in uh, German. Okay. Tertius gaudens is the rejoicing third. It is the third party that benefits when two other people are in a dispute. 
Uh, okay, jo- so it's 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 like a flavor of 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 Schadenfreude. It's a flavor of Schadenfreude, yeah. but basically uh, a situation in which one party benefits from a conflict among two others. The rejoicing third. <laughs> so, like the kids. You know that like when I, in my grade school at Devon's Drive Public School, whenever there was a fight, we would form a wall, like a circle around them to make sure that the teachers couldn't get in and would start yelling fight. <laughs> and we're kind of, you know, it, it was basically, you know, break out the popcorn, fight, fight, right. fight. Right. So those kids, I'm not going to count myself among them. Well, maybe, but it's awful. Anyway, those they're kids the were experi- yeah. They are that they're not experienced. Tertius they are Gaudens. They are the Tertius Gaudens. The rejoicing third. In that conflict. Yeah. All right. And, and it, Spender was talking about, he was talking about the triad, right? He's basically saying it's very under, it's, it's everywhere we look, everywhere we try to persuade each other. Uh, there's triads everywhere, right? Uh, uh, dyads don't normally work for persuasion or for getting stories across because they're too, it's too simple. A triad basically gives you a story, right? There is the love triangle. There's the whatever. So the, the uh, like, I guess a fundamental part of all stories is the Tertius Gaudens. So um, another one uh, occurred to me this morning, and, and I'm going to go out on a limb here. I think I may have found a spot where the etymologists are, don't quite understand the word. Okay. So in Sanskrit, <laughs> which I've been hanging around recently, they have this great thing they do where uh, there'll be a word and then its opposite will just be the A uh, attached yeah. to it. We have it in English too, like typical and atypical and that stuff. We've talked mm-hmm. about this. Yeah. Right. So like uh, vidya is truth. Avidya is falsehood. So um, I was looking, I was thinking of the word essence this morning mm-hmm. and essence, the essence of a thing is, uh, it's basically the part you can't see. It's the hidden part. So if you take you or me, right? What the essence of Matt, it's not, we can't see it on the surface of you, right? The essence of you is something deeper than what we could take a picture of or count or what have you. Hmm. So, so the etymologists all say essence comes from the Latin root of essa, which means to be. And they just sort of let the second half of the word um, slide. And I was looking at it, I was like, oh, no, no this, sound, this looks like Sanskrit. So you have sense, the parts of things that are sensory that you mm-hmm. can grasp with your senses, and essence the part that you can't so the part of you that can't that we can't or like take a the the mangoness of a mango right you can't you can't (laughs) you can't describe it right like the pure essence of a thing can't really be described it's the isness of it right it's the thing that can't be captured by the senses sense essence Paging the OED. Paging right. the OED. You've exactly. got it wrong. Okay. I think they did. I think they did. Also, incidentally, Essence of Matt is a new fragrance um, <laughs> available on my, my Kickstarter. <laughs> get a signed bar. Get a, get a signed bottle if you, if you go on there. Many a, bar, a bar if you use, if you're more of a body wash. It's its own reward. Guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on which note... Uh, instead of an Oriabindo for closing today, um, I've been reading this guy. Uh, his name is uh, Sri Sadguru Siddha Rameshwar Maharaj. Just wonderful. He's part of the Vedantic uh, tradition, which includes Oriabindo, our patron saint here on how to tug yourself. And he was describing Vedanta, which is basically the philosophy of the self. And he said, Vedanta is like a book that puts an end to unhappiness. Sweet. So you just have to read it. All you got to do is read it and you will be smiling all the way home. Thank you for listening people. We will be back with you in a week. Bye-bye. After 
present moment Traveling town to town The mystery of the motion Right here, right now Right here, right now Whoa, right here, right now You've been listening to How to Tickle Yourself with your hosts, Duff McDonald and Matt McButter. You can help us by liking, subscribing, and sharing this podcast with others. You can talk to us and see what else is happening on Instagram and Facebook at How to Tickle Yourself. This program was recorded in Studio B of the historic Rock Ledge Recording Studio and the Tunnel Under Arundel. Right here, right now, our original 16-part theme music was written and recorded by the legendary Paul Reddick and Kyle Ferguson of The Sidemen, with the brilliant Steve Mariner on bass and drums and in the mixing room. The podcast is produced and distributed by Storic Media. Our editor is Andrew Steiner. Our coordinator is Samantha Abramovitz. Our producers are Kristen Verbitsky and Chuck LaBella. For more information, visit storicmedia.com. That's S-T-O-R-I-C media.com. My love, my dear.